hey, welcome everybody to uh, another Code is Craft event. This is our semi-regular speaker series. Uh, you can find out about events like these and other Etsy goings on by following us on Twitter, twitter.com slash codescraft. Also our blog, codescraft.com. Also our mailing list, which you can find on that blog. Um, yeah, so tonight's speaker is uh, Matt Marquis. We're really excited to have him here. You might know him as a advocate of serving a good experience to all folks despite what sorts of powered devices or size of devices or geography or what have you. Uh, you might also know him by his combative Twitter presence. <laughs> or, <laughs> but you might not know that he also believes so much in accessibility of um, a, a great user experience that he did what few of us would choose to do, but uh, dove into the spec authoring and shepherding process uh, to give us a new uh, specification for uh, responsive image stuff. And so he's going to tell us all about that. Uh, thank you so much, Matt Marquis. So at the risk of sounding dramatic, which is not something I am wont to do. I'm here to talk about how you and me changed web standards and how we are going to change the entire goddamned web next. And I'm going to do this using awkwardly timed references to The Legend of Zelda. <laughs> Most famously, you may know me from this tweet, which is going to haunt me for the remainder of my natural life. I have long had some opinions about images. I tweeted this a very long time ago, long before I became the chair of the Responsive Images Community Group at the W3C. I work at Boku. Boku believes in the open web, and that phrase means a lot of things to a lot of people, and Boku has decided to just kind of run with that. There is no single Boku way of doing things. We don't insist on technology X or methodology Y. Boku believes in building things that make the web itself better, not just producing one good project at a time. We believe in the web. And Boku hired me because I'm a crazy person. Until recently, I worked at Filament Group, which is where I learned to be crazy. Filament Group obsesses. They obsess over keeping requests low, over saving bandwidth, over ensuring universal access to the web for users of any context. Filament Group believes in making the web better, faster, more accessible, more inclusive. So as you can likely guess, we took to responsive web design in a big way. Filament Group has never been big fans of a highest common denominator approach, uh, multiple canvases made to suit the newest and trendiest frames. We've never believed in imposing rules and limitations on the web, which by its very nature was designed to be device agnostic. <clears throat> so as most of you know, responsive web design, per Ethan's original definition, is made up of three things. A flexible grid, media queries, and flexible images and media. Since then, we developers have managed to expand on his original definition, adding one thing in particular to the equation and that is that we have given responsive web design a reputation. Responsive web design takes a lot of blame for mistakes that we as developers make day to day. And there was a time, long, long ago, when this web stuff was just too damn hard for us. But we were young back then, and we didn't know any better, and we needed the money. We eventually realized that it wasn't fair of us to put the burden on users just because we ourselves were unable to cope with matters of context. We realized that we, as an industry, just had to get better at this stuff. But at least we had the decency to warn people when we were taking the easy way out back then. I sometimes wonder if we shouldn't be putting up warnings now the same way. So just like in the days before responsive web design, we've actually chosen a single, familiar, comfortable context for the sites we're building. 
It's not a screen size. It's not 960 pixels wide. It's not even a specific device. We've, we've started to learn from the mistakes we made when the iPhone first came out. We're moving past that. Instead, maybe without realizing it, we're choosing to build websites that suit our context, our day-to-day -day browsing context, the browsing conditions that we ourselves are used to. Not for nothing, but we have it pretty easy. We're developers. We have fast computers. We have tons of bandwidth. I'm not certain I can breathe air that doesn't have Wi-Fi in it at this point. But that's our context. That's what we're used to. That's comfortable. It's familiar. We have the privilege of assuming high bandwidth and stable network connections. We can assume that any request we send out is going to result in something being sent back. Possibly as a result, the average web page is now more than 1.8 megabytes. Images alone account for more than 60% of that, making up a full megabyte of the average page. Now, over the past few years, the average weight of our CSS hasn't really budged. Uh, adding a couple of media queries to our style sheets is not to blame for this increased page weight. Our JavaScript has crept up a little bit, but when you think about some of the incredibly rich interactions we've seen on the web in the past couple of years alone, a few kilobytes seems pretty excusable here. Images, however, are doing significant damage and have been, and it's getting worse in a hurry. As we let our pages get bigger and bigger, we're not just creating a nuisance for ourselves. <clears throat> Universal access is the fundamental underlying truth of the web. Building massive resource-heavy websites means excluding millions of users who have only ever known the web by way of feature phones or slightly better. These are users paying for every kilobyte they consume, users that already have to keep tabs on which sites they need to avoid day to day to avoid incurring the cost of just visiting them one time. And I don't mean some nebulous, hand-wavy bandwidth cost. I mean actual economic cost. While he was working at YouTube, Chris Zacharias, he took it upon himself as sort of like a personal challenge to get their watch page down from 1.4 megabytes to under 100 kilobytes, which sounds absurd. He managed to do most of this work during one of his commutes, getting the total page weight down to 250 kilobytes without a hell of a lot of effort. After he went through and manually pared down their CSS and JavaScript and dropped in an HTML5 video player in place of the Flash one, he got the page weight down to around 98 kilobytes. He named this project Feather. After he opted a subset of users into this new experience, the average load time for their watch page increased by a huge amount, which was completely inexplicable until he looked at the regions that were accessing that page for the first time. He writes, there was a disproportionate increase in traffic from places like Southeast Asia, South Africa, uh, South America, sorry, and even remote regions of Siberia. Further investigation revealed that in these places, the average page load time under Feather was over two minutes just to get to the first frame of video, just to load the page. This meant that a regular video page at over a megabyte was taking more than 20 minutes to load normally. Now that it only took two minutes to get to that first frame of video, entire populations of people could use YouTube for the first time. Imagine knowing every time you saw a YouTube link pop up on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, that that was not meant for you. That even attempting to watch that video could drain your entire data plan and leave you with nothing. Now imagine hearing that that had changed, that it was still expensive and it still took a long time, but you could watch videos on the internet now, something we all take for granted. Chris Zacharias made that happen, one developer with a couple hours of work. Building massive websites isn't just an inconvenience. It's us shifting the burden of those few hours of work onto every single user that visits our sites. It's us saying that we're willing to build something that isn't for some users, because that's what's easiest for us. And what we're doing lately is building a web for us. That's not what the web is to me. That's not what this job is to me. The meaning I take from this gig doesn't come from getting a div to show up in the right place on the right day. It comes from knowing that working a little bit harder can mean that entire populations, just setting foot on the web for the first time, can tap into the collected knowledge of the whole of mankind. 
That's huge. There is no other job in the world like that. So yes, you bet your asses I'm gonna talk about images for an entire hour. <laughs> I am also a huge hit at parties. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. <clears throat> so it doesn't take a hell of a lot of imagination to see why the average image weight has shot up so very quickly in just a few short years. We are constantly surrounded by high resolution displays now. And a retina image isn't necessarily twice as big. It's twice as big in both dimensions. A true retina image can be up to four times larger if the compression algorithm doesn't work out in our favor. We can't just serve these up to everybody indiscriminately, especially when the vast majority of users will see no benefit whatsoever. A high resolution image on a low resolution screen looks like a low resolution image. At best, that's just wasteful. At worst, an uh, older mobile browser sees all this data bearing down, rubs mud in its hair, and runs screaming into the woods, leaving the page partially rendered. This is, um, for the record, the most handsome dog any of you have ever seen in your lives. <laughs> and he's a good boy. <laughs> yes, he is. So this isn't a plea for everyone to go back to grainy images. I love a good image. I do. Janocycles.com is an amazing website. Not only is the photography unbelievable, but they've managed to build the first and only Harley that I can actually tolerate looking at. The only one. When I visit their index page on this shiny, expensive Retina MacBook, I know what I'm in for with all this photography. It's a very big website. It's a beautiful page, but the bandwidth cost for comparison here is a link. This works to download the complete works of William Shakespeare in a single PDF. I did not go to college, um, but I am told he wrote a great deal of things. <laughs> the PDF format, as I've heard also, is not notorious for its efficiency. So this file is pretty big. This is 3.9 megabytes. It's not small. If you were to download this file three times, it still wouldn't use as much data as it uses one time loading that single page to look at some motorbikes. There was a lot more they could be doing to deal with the size of these images, even on this shiny new Retina MacBook. Here's where we get into real trouble, though. Visiting this page on a non-Retina display, it is 14 megabytes. High-resolution images on a low-resolution screen look like low-resolution images. These are massive downloads, and I'm seeing absolutely no benefit. Likewise, visiting this page on a tiny iPhone screen, still 14 megabytes. That's about 6% of AT&T's lowest monthly data plan to load this one page, one time, to look at motorbikes. If I visit this page on an old low-resolution Android device, it melts away and burns my hand. These massive images are getting sent on the wire the exact same way, even when the user will see no benefit whatsoever. And I don't mean to pick on any one website. This is a much, much bigger issue than that. 72% of responsive sites are sending roughly the same assets to users of any context. Only about 6% of responsive sites are taking significant steps to tailor assets to the user's context. And that last statistic doesn't really track with reality. 71% of mobile users expect a website to load as fast or faster on mobile than it does anywhere else. I can vouch for this. Even here in the US, where a huge website is a little more than a nuisance, you have like two seconds before someone on the train jingles their keys, and I get, promptly get distracted from whatever it was I tapped a second ago. I'm willing to bet there isn't a single person here who hasn't tapped a link on Twitter thinking, oh, this looks interesting, and then promptly stopped caring while the page was blank. It's not just us. 160 kilobytes worth of images is not a hell of a lot in the grand scheme but it's enough that your bounce rate is apt to increase by a great deal. So we pretty clearly have a problem. That's why I've been on this responsive images crusade. Even if every single one of you here were convinced that this is a real problem, that we need to solve this, that we need to go into work tomorrow and start solving this issue once and for all, that wouldn't be enough. There are too few of us, and the steps to solve this in our day-to-day -day work aren't as clear-cut as they need to be. This is something I want solved at the browser level. 
This is something I want baked into HTML5, something we all just do as a matter of course in every project. I'm here to tell you all that we have actually made that happen, and that solution will be here very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an image tag. It does only one thing, and in fairness, it does it well. It fetches a single image source, and it puts it on your screen. So give me a few minutes. This is going somewhere. Visually, dealing with images is easy. You guys probably all know this one. To make an image flexible, we remove the width and the height attributes. By then setting a max width of 100% in our CSS, we're saying this image should never overflow its parent container. That container resizes, the image resizes, that's it. So it's easy. But what about the media part of that equation? What about our, what about our videos and our cool canvas infographics? What happens to our mission critical flash intros in a responsive site? It's still pretty easy. It can get a lot more complicated than this, but that's the basic gist. The trouble with this approach is that it requires us to use assets that are at least as large as the largest size at which they'll be displayed. If an image is going to be displayed anywhere from 2,000 pixels wide to three, this is 2,000 pixels exactly, I measured earlier, <laughs> to 300 pixels wide, you're still serving that same 2,000 pixel image up to everybody. Now, HTML5's video specification used to make this surprisingly painless to deal with. You could put a media query right in an attribute on a source element. So in this example, the smaller video is served to any user with a display smaller than 600 pixels. I say used to intentionally. This works in every major browser but Chrome. This was removed from Chrome because it was recently dropped from the spec because not enough people used it. So this is intentional that I bring this up. All of you are going to use this now. Because <laughs> this made a lot of sense. This worked great. And now we have nothing. So do this. this like Windows Phone, Android 2.3, this works everywhere except current Chrome. So video is pretty easy, but this guy sucks. The image tag can really only do the one thing that it does right. Let's fetch a single image source and put it on your screen as quickly as possible. So while we were working on the globe, we tried developing a means of serving uh, larger images to users with larger viewports, beginning with the philosophy that it should err on the side of mobile. Start with a mobile-sized and formatted image, and then selectively enhance it up to a larger image, depending on the size of the user's display or viewport. This way, if anything should break down, we're still erring on the side of caution. It's a smaller image, but it's still perfectly representative content. It looks a little weird, but if you didn't know that it looked a little weird, it would just look like part of the design. The key to this was getting the screens within JavaScript and relaying that information to the server in time to defer that initial request for the image. Otherwise, we end up with two requests per image on larger displays. We put together a clever little hack that relied on cookies and a spacer GIF. We are not a proud people. <laughs> we did what we had to do. And it worked really well, believe it or not, until it completely broke. Prefetching, or speculative pre-parsing, is a huge part of what makes browsers feel fast. Before we can even see a page, sometimes before we even intentionally navigate there, the browser starts requesting assets so that they're closer to ready by the time the page appears, which is why you don't hit a page now, see the whole layout come in, and then the image starts crawling in from the top like way back in the day. All of a sudden, these images' sources were being requested before we had a chance to apply any of our custom logic. But we tried. And we got desperate. And what followed was a sordid tale no script tags and document write, dynamically injected base tags, eval. It was the web developer equivalent of scary campfire stories. It was a web dev meetup in Night Vale. It was not pretty, and more importantly, none of it worked. So we kept dragging everybody we could find into these conversations. Uh, Ethan and Scott Jell, they're from the beginning. 
We pulled in Paul Irish, Nicholas Gallagher, uh, Tim Cadlick, Jason Grigsby, half the jQuery team. We put together the Avengers of putting semicolons places and still nothing. There was always a compromise somewhere. It was a wasted request for some context or a total dependency on JavaScript to show any images at all, which might be fine on a one-off project, but not something we were willing to say to the entire internet, here's your solution. So despite having all these freaky robot brains in the same room, it was becoming fairly obvious that responsive images were not something that could be solved with sufficiently clever bit of JavaScript. And even if we did, we would then be working around those browser level optimizations instead of taking advantage of them. We'd be trying to break prefetching instead of using it to load images quicker. So we started hashing out ideas for a native solution. If HTML5 offered us a way of solving this, what might that look like? Bruce Lawson originally proposed a markup pattern for delivering context-appropriate images that fell in line with the existing rich media elements in HTML5, the video and the audio tag. <clears throat> Even borrowing that media attribute. The image here, inside picture, would give us an incredibly powerful fallback pattern. It wouldn't be the sort of standard where we had to wait and where people commented on our blog posts, what about IE? In an unsupported browser, they would get that image that we were gonna use anyway. In supported browsers, they would get a better experience. This is progressive enhancement baked into the spec. It sounds great. This made a ton of sense to us. So we take this to the What Working Group, one of the two groups responsible for the ongoing development of HTML5. We were told we hadn't done the requisite paperwork and that it wasn't our place to show up and suggest solutions. Our role was to bring them problems that they might deign to solve them for us. So meanwhile, a member of the W3C's HTML working group, the other group responsible for the ongoing development of HTML5, suggested we try out their new community group program, which was aimed at giving web developers a more formalized voice in web standards, and we could get our paperwork in order there. While we were doing that, the What Working Group pitched their idea for a markup-based means of delivering context-appropriate images. When I say pitched, I mean that they added it to the draft specification within four days of someone casually bringing it up in an IRC channel with no paperwork. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm fine. You may be wondering what that markup looks like. Well, I submit this syntax without comment. <laughs> In the interest of diplomacy, I will say that this was not well received by the members of the fledgling responsive images community group. So I'll spare everybody the gory details, but I did what any outraged internet person does about anything, is I went and I blogged about it. We butted heads with the What Working Group for quite some time. It was not what I would strictly call productive um, and I don't mind saying that I'm to blame for a lot of ongoing tension between the two groups. I am from Boston. We are not a diplomatic people. <laughs> the thing is, some signal did end up coming through all of the noise during that time. The What Working Group's proposal did seem to handle one part of the equation in an especially efficient way, just resolution switching. Further, it did it outside of media queries, which we actually ended up liking for a couple of reasons. Splitting this, things up this way makes sense. For the most part, we had two separate concerns in play. I've broken my presentation. Everything is ruined forever. What you doing? <laughs> you gonna show the coat? Cool, so, <laughs> new keynote. We still rely on media attributes to choose the appropriate source element itself. That makes sense. We would decide on these breakpoints based on a combination of factors. Um, the weight of the images, alternate cropping and zooming to better highlight the, the focus of the image, the way we'd want it on the globe. These media queries are kind of an absolute. Whatever we say in those should happen. 
full stop, no matter what, just like the media queries in our layout. After we've established the correct source element, we then present the resolution options. This is where we use a portion of the What Working Group's proposed source set proposal to uh, determine which resolution source may be most appropriate. If I'm on a Retina MacBook, but I'm tethered to a thraky, shaky 3G connection, I probably don't want massive high resolution images. The original picture specification ensured we were serving image assets more efficiently, but it didn't do anything to address bandwidth concerns directly, and that came up a lot. We were being more efficient about how we served assets, but we weren't specifically tailoring things to bandwidth limitations. We spent a lot of time thinking about how we might do that syntactically. A server-side solution could give us an assumption based on the device, but my phone is apt to be on anything from edge to a Wi-Fi connection. That doesn't really get us very far. So the best thing we came up with was a bandwidth media query. And then we shared the mailing list equivalent of strained, silent looks around a dinner table as we realized we all hated that idea a lot. It sounds great. If we had a bandwidth media query, we could use picture to tailor assets to the user's actual bandwidth. We could use this for CSS images as well. We can make tons of optimizations bandwidth-wise. There are a couple of serious problems with this. The first issue is that we could not ensure a consistent browsing experience for the user. Where I set that bandwidth breakpoint is completely different from where someone else might set that bandwidth breakpoint. The user would end up with high resolution images on one site and low resolution images on the next, and the web would end up looking kind of broken. Second, we'd be making all this optional. What happens when whoever signs the paychecks says, but you don't understand? Our product is very important. It's worth the wait for our images. They're very nice. This shouldn't be up to us at all. This should be left up completely to the user. Syntactically, how would we begin to express that? And there's a technical problem with the idea of the bandwidth media query. Bandwidth is unpredictable. Media queries are designed to respond to changes on the client side. Viewport height and width, device orientation, even ambient lighting conditions in upcoming proposals. When the user first lands on a page, they might qualify for our high resolution images, then have their bandwidth drop off when they go through a tunnel. Now we have to send them low resolution images while they're browsing because the media query cannot not listen for those changes. As soon as they come out of the tunnel, we have to send them those high resolution images again. The only way to work around this would be to redefine the very nature of media queries themselves. As you can probably guess, that doesn't go over well on a web standards mailing list. But source set is brand new, so we can do whatever the hell we want with that. Unlike media queries, this is now spec'd explicitly vague, which is a very web standards term, as a set of suggestions. This tells the browser, here are the sources most appropriate for your display. Take them or leave them. By acting as a suggestion, it allows browsers to introduce user settings, like always give me low resolution images. Give me high resolution images as bandwidth permits. Instead of each of us drawing a separate line for where those assets get served, it's now built into the browser. Instead of frantically responding to changes in bandwidth, the browser just takes an average across the entire browsing session and uses that while the user is browsing. So we eventually codified things like this in a use cases and requirements document, a checklist that any new standard or set of new standards should be capable of addressing. This all ended up in the second version of the picture proposal. We formally proposed this second version to the HTML working group rather than the what working group, and it reached first public working draft, which means it was time for browsers to start actually digging in and asking us questions and giving us feedback. And then nothing happened for months. A little bit of feedback would trickle in from time to time, like by way of Twitter, which is not particularly productive. Developers were very excited about this idea. The browsers were not into it at all. 
So after those few months, we started wondering what exactly our next steps were. And we called it. The picture element, despite our best efforts, was not progressing. Fortunately, neither was the extended source set syntax that the What Working Group had proposed. Mysteriously, none of the browsers liked that either. So the HTML Working Group gave us the option of publishing the picture specification as a note. Fully removed from the standards track, a archived record of the work that we had done. I did not respond to that email. Um, spam filter. So things were quiet for a while and a little anxious until Tab Atkins at Google proposed a completely new syntax for responsive images altogether using custom numbered source attributes on the old image tag that we know so well. So this SRCN proposal gained a tremendous amount of traction in a very short time. Enough that browsers were willing to make public statements that responsive images were coming. So we teamed up with Tab Atkins to iron out some, any issues with the syntax and make sure it aligned with the use cases we'd outlined previously. It turns out that it did line up really close with what we'd wanted from picture. Both allowed us to take advantage of the same media queries we're used to using in our layouts. Both take advantage of the same shorthand for device pixel ratio, both allowing for that, that user override. Both provided a solid fallback pattern in the event that this new markup isn't supported. One key difference is that picture was dependent on the order of the source elements. The first one to match is the one that gets selected. So it was video elements work the same way. So it was worth reusing that source selection algorithm rather than introduce a whole new version of those source elements altogether. But there isn't any precedent for source order when it comes to attributes. Nothing like that's built into HTML. So instead, the numbered attributes will tell the browser where to look first. The source order wouldn't matter. SRCN also introduced the potential for a browser to fully automate the selection of sources. And this is a little weird, but ride this out. It used a syntax that allowed us to provide the browser with information about the sources themselves, rather than the way they'd be displayed. A lot of times, we don't need explicit control over what source is shown when. A lot of times, we want to wire up our CMS. So same as always, the user uploads a giant image. The server creates a couple of different sizes of the exact same image. And we want to serve the one that fits closest to the viewport. With this syntax, the browser could use the same kind of override it used for device pixel ratio, but for everything. It could serve any image source that was most appropriate depending on the viewport, the resolution, the bandwidth available, with a little bit of input from us in situations where we were willing to give up that explicit control. So the first part here, before the semicolon, says that this image is meant to be shown at 100% of the viewport's width. This is already weird. But at the time the images are prefetched, we don't know anything about our layout. None of our CSS is available. So the only thing the browser has to go on is the size of the viewport itself. The second part is the list of sources and their inherent widths. So here, small.jpg is a source with an actual width of 400 pixels, like if you open it up in Photoshop or whatever, and so on down the line. This is inscrutable. <laughs> there is nothing like this in markup. It's really weird. The thing is, the only way a browser can ever know anything about an image is by fully requesting it and trying to display it. Any syntax that required the browser to download every single asset associated with an element would be worse than not having a responsive images solution. So if we want the browser to make any decisions for us, we have to give it that information up front. So whatever. The syntax was very weird. But offloading all the decision making to the browser sounded very appealing. I didn't always want to write out all of the picture markup all the time. That was the number one complaint we got, was that there were too many letters in it. We didn't necessarily have to know how the browser even chose the source it did. You just give it that list and let it do whatever it is it's going to do. Let it optimize to its heart con heart's content. And while that did work well, that wasn't required. There were still situations where we needed that explicit control. 
and this proposal still gave us that, using syntax very similar to the picture element that we've wanted all along. So this looks great, except for a minor issue, which is that numbered attributes are really friggin' weird. This is nowhere in web development. There's no sort of precedent for anything anywhere near like this. For the most part, people really like this proposal. It did a lot of things right. It was promising enough that responsive images are coming. Nobody liked the numbered attributes. Timothy Hatcher, a major decision maker on Apple's WebKit team, described them as a grotesque perversion of the HTML language, signing his email with, best of luck. <laughs> and this was damning enough that WebKit proper wanted nothing to do with this proposal anymore. This is off the table. WebKit will not implement this, and that makes it a non-starter for everyone. So that was that. WebKit killed SRCN. Though it was hard to argue with the reasoning behind it and impossible to come up with a better alternative to the numbered attributes. It's the scariest game over screen in video game history. So this marked the end of the pretty good, but admittedly a little weird, sequel to the picture element. So the, the joke with these slides is that like it was weird, the proposal, but it was still pretty good. Like Zelda 2. Nice. <laughs> Nobody likes Zelda 2. I'm the only one. <sighs> I thought it was a good game. Whatever, you guys. This is free. So, <laughs> speaking of weird and good, right around the time WebKit killed off SRCN, Mozilla marked their open issue for the full gross what working group SRC set syntax as won't fix. Same story. No matter what, we will not implement this. And if one browser takes it off the table for good, it's a no-go, non-starter. Both officially dead and buried, and we are left with nothing. It has been two years at this point. I and many people have been working on this a lot for free. I am eager to see this fixed. Developers in general are eager to see this fixed. And browsers are sweating a little because they just announced that responsive images are coming and then all the proposals went away. So it is for the best that my spam filter caught that email and I never replied, and the picture was never removed from the standards track. Ladies and gentlemen, picture element mark three, a nickname that only I like and has not caught on at all. We have rewritten the entire spec, making it dramatically easier for implementers without sacrificing any of the features that we had spec for picture originally. As you all well know, the third one in the series is always the best one. But we learned our lesson from the last time we finished a spec and we put it out there and then nothing happened. We didn't actually publish this through the What Working Group or the HTML Working Group. We published it ourselves, which is not technically something we are able to do. We shopped it around to browsers ourselves. And pirate radio web standards is cool and all, but we did something way bigger than that, something nobody in web standards has ever done before. We built it. Thanks to the developer community, thanks to people here, odds are, we did something web standards has never seen. We hired Yoav Weiss, an independent developer, full time, to work on the Blink implementation of the picture element. He finished that work up a few weeks ago, working alongside the Chrome team. He is now the only Chromium developer who's able to review patches that doesn't have a Gmail account. The only one on the list with his own domain. He's currently working on rewriting and porting that code over to WebKit as we speak. So we, just some scrubs, just web developers like everybody here, saw a new standard through from initial proposal to a complete implementation never happened in the history of the web. And once implementations are underway, the browsers have spoken, it goes into the spec proper. 
and I want to stress here, especially if you hate it, that I am not the one responsible for the picture element. I helped, but for the most part, my role was to make the most noise about it, something I'm OK at. Members of the Responsive Images community group have put in, without exaggeration, thousands of unpaid hours between dozens of people because that's how strongly they feel this is an issue that needs to be solved. Writing and reviewing specifications, something none of us knew how to do out of the gate. Designing, writing tests, submitting patches to browsers. This is a standards effort led entirely by the community, not by any one browser or any one person. The RICG is made up of you guys. There are more than 350 of us now, last I saw. The largest of the W3C's community groups, definitely the only ones who have hauled off and published their own thing. Nobody tell anyone. We're made up of everything from freelancers to now representatives from Disney and Apple. I sincerely hope everyone here will be a part of it too. All of our work takes place in the open on GitHub. Uh, tests, demos, specifications. We are enormously proud to have been a number of people's first time contributions to any open source project. And that's the spec forever. This is in browsers. That's amazing. Not to spoil any surprises, he said with some lingering doubt, but we are just getting started. So keep an eye on responsiveimages.org to stay on top of the standards-y part of this whole equation and absolutely join up with the RICG. So this is risky, because this is small. Show of hands. Is anyone here actually a formal member of the, w, of, of the RICG? Went through the weird W3C site, that's fine. I'm barely one myself. How about anyone who's like blogged or tweeted or complained about responsive images or Pinterested something about it? I don't know what kids do these days. Hands up if you've said responsive images on the internet. Thanks to you, the picture element is officially shipping in Firefox 33, Chrome 38, and Opera 25. We made that happen. We've never done that with a feature before. And we can start using it right now. This is the part of the talk, historically, where I've had to be like, and that's cool. Let's think about that someday. And I would like wink and nudge, you can't use this yet, but no, we can legitimately use this. Um, Scott Jail came up with a picture polyfill way back when we were writing the original spec, just to kind of get our heads around it, and we've maintained it over time as the spec has been updated. It is the official picture element polyfill of the Responsive Images Community Group. I don't know if you guys could tell, but I am like wicked into our logo. What other web standards group has a cool logo? This was important to me. So picture fill started out following more or less the same pattern as the picture element, just using divs, spans, and HTML5's data attributes, all standards compliant markup with roughly the behavior we'd want it from the picture element. No prefetching, a dependency on JavaScript, as was the best we could come up with, but it allowed us to kind of get our heads around how it might work. It would have been way too early to start slapping the picture element wholesale on websites because we didn't know how the spec was gonna change. How we implemented it that day might be completely different a week from then in terms of behavior. But the spec is stable now, and real implementations are actually on their way. So as of version 2.0, picture fill has evolved into a real responsive images polyfill. The picture element, the source set attribute, all of it. So on this, the built-in fallback image works the same way as we'd want it with picture, with picture fill. If, for whatever reason, picture isn't, picture isn't supported, it falls back to using picture fill. If it's natively supported, it throws the polyfill away altogether. If none of it works, it falls back to an inner image. So any work we do with responsive images is going to break down to one of these four use cases or some combination of these four use cases. The art direction use case refers to any situation where you need that 100% explicit control over what source is displayed when. And that's when we use the picture element in the way we'd originally proposed it years ago at this point. Multiple source elements, each with a media attribute. 
Art direction comes into play whenever you want to specify an alternate version of the image for a different viewport. Not just a smaller version of an identical image, but alternate cropping, alternate zooming that has to take place at a certain point to align with our layouts. Media queries still make the most sense here. We want to have that line up sometimes one-to-one -one with our layout media queries. Now, our direction does not apply to radically different image sources. A good rule of thumb is that you want all of your images, every source that's served up by that element, to be accurately described by the one alt attribute on the inner image. All the accessibility hinges on that inner image. I say rule of thumb um, because I put my name at the top of the spec and I promised pinky swear people wouldn't use it the way I just described. It's a rule of thumb because I will find you and I will break your thumb if you do this. If I see a welcome to my iPhone site, courtesy of picture, I will lose my mind. <laughs> so, like I said earlier, the first source element with a media attribute that matches is the one that gets selected. If we're using min with media queries, we want to have our largest sources first. When we're using max with media queries, we want to make sure our smallest sources come first. This is a little weird when you're just reading it off a slide. Once you've tried it out a few times, it falls into place pretty quick. Device pixel ratio, the second use case, is pretty much what it says on the tin. This is concerned strictly with viewport resolution. So this use case is pretty cut and dry, and we don't necessarily need the entire picture element for this. There's a lot of times where we'll have an image that's always going to be displayed at one size, like a user's avatar or whatever, and we just want to be able to serve a high resolution one when it's appropriate. This still works on the old image tag, and it takes advantage of prefetching and makes one request. So this works whether we're using it on picture source elements, like we'd originally proposed, or on image. Both allow for that bandwidth-based override, the way we talked about ages ago. And if you need that super precise control over both sources and resolution, you use it in combination with picture. This is verbatim the second picture proposal. The behavior of the syntax is a little different from how we might expect because we have now provided the browser with, inf with information it didn't have with the old image tag and just SRC. Instead of just serving up an image that's twice as big and scaling it down with CSS the way we're kind of used to at this point, SRC set can tell the browser it's dealing with a 2x source. This is twice as big as it necessarily needs to be. So instead of just spitting out any old image, the browser knows enough to render this at half the physical size, if that makes sense, just twice the density. Like so. The types use case is kind of a bonus um, that we almost literally snuck into the specification. This syntax is not concerned with viewport size or resolution or any of the things we've discussed so far, to tell you the truth. This is strictly concerned with what image formats are supported by the user's browser. It allows us to use that single request fallback pattern that's built into picture, something unlike anything else in HTML, to make smarter decisions about serving new formats. One of the most common suggestions we'd heard, usually from people just joining the responsive images discussion, um, was that we just, scare quotes intentional, need a new format. We just need a single image that itself somehow contains every single image we could possibly need to serve in that area. To make this happen, we would first need a company to fund this. Apple would have to say, we are willing to bend, spend millions of dollars researching this new format and give it away for free to all the other browsers. So, that's the easy part. Then we'd need new markup anyway, so we could figure out when to show which source, which is a little trickier, but fine. Then to handle transferring only parts of that single file rather than the whole, uh, we would need to invent a new protocol for the web to run on, like instead of HTTP. This is usually about the end of that conversation. But this did get us thinking. 
one of the less impossible stumbling blocks to this magic image format would be serving it in a more responsible way on the client side. A new image format can't have a fallback pattern in and of itself. The browser has to request the whole thing, and if it's unrecognized, throw it away. It can't contain a fallback image. The best solutions we have for this all involve making that request and chucking it out and swapping in a new one. But Picture's built to make a single request for an appropriate source. So now we can tell the browser to disregard a source altogether unless it recognizes the contents of a type attribute. So in this example, any browser that supports SVG will get the SVG source, the first to match. Every other browser will throw that source away and just request the ping. One request prefetched. And this is forward thinking. Any new format that comes along is going to come with its own MIME type, and that'll work the exact same way. So now we have a couple of options for explicit control over image sources. And we'll need that sometimes, absolutely. But it was really appealing to think about not thinking about responsive images. Because I get tired of thinking about responsive images. I assume everyone will at some stage. So we've added a new attribute, sizes, that works the same way as that third part of the SRCN syntax that got obliterated by WebKit. We would use this in situations where we didn't need explicit control, where we just wanted to upload one big image have the server churn out a couple of smaller versions and serve them up when appropriate. Likewise, this syntax requires us to give the browser some information about the sources. This looks kind of familiar. So the viewport size, pixel density, bandwidth, all factored in to whatever decision is made about which source is most appropriate here. This also means there's room for the browser to get creative, which is a terrifying sentence in and of itself but in this case is actually pretty good. Like Firefox has proposed that using the syntax, if the user loads the largest source and then scales their viewport down, it doesn't do anything. Because that largest source already serves for the smaller ones. Why make two more requests for identical looking images? This is still weird. It's still hard to understand at a glance. So let's not worry too much about what these numbers mean on the surface. We're going to do a little familiar responsive web design math. Uh, target divided by context, just like we use in our layouts. So let's say we're looking at this markup on an iPhone. 320 pixel wide viewport, 100 VW units means 100% of the viewport size. Everything still has to be based on the viewport. It's the only information we have at this time. Same deal as that other proposal. Our smallest image has an inherent width of 400 pixels. And this will work with height attributes eventually as well, but doesn't yet. Next image up, 800 pixels wide, target divided by context. We end up with a couple of numbers. We don't necessarily need to know what these mean, but let's just set these aside. The math we just did here is what the browser does when it encounters this markup. It takes the user's current viewport and divides it against the image source sizes. These calculated values then work the same way as that 1x, 2x syntax we would write out by hand, except specifically tailored to the viewport size. So we end up with a list of resolution options that are specific to that user's viewport. If we're on a Retina iPhone here, looking at that previous syntax, the browser would choose the 2.5x source, the closest one that matches 2x. If we run a non-retina iPhone, the browser serves us the smallest image here, the closest match to 1x. Now, if we were to view that previous syntax on a 640 pixel wide display, the results of all that math would end up completely different. The smallest source would no longer ever match. That just gets thrown away. That's too small, too, too low a resolution. The medium source now matches low resolution devices, the largest source on high resolution devices. This does not make any sense out loud. I'm fully aware. It took me a lot of using it before it started to click for me. And when it clicked for me, I realized I didn't need it to click in the first place. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it does that math or how it reaches which source is most appropriate. We just give it a list of options, and then we let the browser take the wheel, and that's fine. So these four primary use cases, 
were the subject of a massive and terrifyingly thorough guide to responsive images that Opera published not long ago. They broke down the syntax in terms of every possible combination of those four syntaxes you could ever need, and that includes all of them at once. Every single new syntax in one element, everything were afforded by the entire responsive images specification. Look on my works, ye nerdy, and despair. This is insane. This is, this is all the proof anyone needs to say you have unleashed a syntactical abomination on the web and should be deeply ashamed. I get it, I'm a developer, I judge, we judge for a living. The thing is, this markup represents 100% pixel perfect control over 24 image sources across two different formats and a number of breakpoints and multiple resolution options all explicitly specified within each breakpoint. You do not need this. You absolutely will not use this. Unless you need this. And then you can use this. A couple of years ago, we had zero native options for serving images in a more responsible, appropriate to the user's context kind of way. Now we have more than we could ever possibly use at the same time. Chris Coyer's codepen.io is using PictureFill strictly for art direction. Viewing this across those two breakpoints, popping this open on your phone versus desktop, you see slightly different images and it cuts the page size in half. This is something he would have had to do with JavaScript anyway to show those images the way he wanted them to in that layout, except it would have been two requests. It would have been bigger than 1.4. Dribble.com is serving assets only, only serving high resolution assets to users with high resolution displays. Again, the page size is cut in half. The user sees absolutely no difference. A high res image on a low res display looks like a low res image. All of this is also part of the Drupal 8 core. This is shipping with every default install of Drupal 8. That is, I believe, a lot of websites. And this is, this is as simple as a little responsive images checkbox. The user uploads one humongous image fit for all contexts being scaled down the same way they always have. But it outputs all those sources on the back end and writes that somewhat inscrutable syntax to the page and no one involved has to think about it at all. You just get more appropriate images depending on your context. And this is the web. If none of the stuff we've discussed here fits some crazy use case you managed to come up with, build something. If nothing else, the image element was impossible to work with. Look at picture as an API for building smarter, responsive images solutions in the future. And if it's really good, go on GitHub. File an issue against the spec. Maybe it's worth adding in the future. So when we started all of this, the goal was to find a solution that worked for each of us individually. One website, one project. So we can make it a little smaller, a little faster. What it evolved into is a solution that all of us can use on every project where it's appropriate to save bandwidth for tens of millions of users. Those users will never see any difference. They won't care what combination of responsive images use cases you applied to the website. They'll see images the way they always have. They'll look appropriate for their context, the way they expect. What they will notice is that the web feels faster now. Responsive web design is still pretty new. We're all still just getting the hang of it, myself included. We're a little clumsy about a couple of things right now. But now we have some tools to get us started in the right direction. We can reverse the trend toward massive resource-heavy websites. We can build a web for everyone. At the beginning of last year, a group of Facebook executives traveled to Nigeria. They bought local devices and SIM cards, and they did their job. They attempted to use Facebook. It didn't work. Just accessing the site, not getting any content down, just trying to load the site one time was enough to wipe out their entire daily prepaid data plan. So if you have them handy, I would like to see some phones. 
if they're right there. You don't have to stress. It's OK. It's good. New York is an iPhone town. <clears throat> Yankees fans. So according to Ericsson, cited in this post, the K-Touch W619, hold it up if you have one, is a good representative of the most common mobile browsing context in the world. It's not the most common phone, but it represents the most common context. It is a single core processor, standard resolution 320 by 480 display. It's running my favorite vintage of Android, 2.3. It is connected to an edge network at best. That is the most common mobile browsing context in the entire world, not ours. We're gonna build a web for those users. And by doing that, we're going to make it better for ourselves at the same time. And when we can't find the tools we need to make that happen, we'll build our own. Thank you. And then uh, when we break, you're welcome to stay for uh, some number of times and hang out with this fine fella and ask him more questions in person. Who, also, who among you has the courage <laughs> to ask me why we're not using CSS? <laughs> yeah. All right, so there's one question right there. Yeah. That's the one. Why aren't we using CSS? I'm glad you asked. So that's, that's a big, this comes up like every few days. This is mixing presentation and content because there's media queries and media queries are from CSS and they're presentational, they are. You can make a case that this is not about styling anything. This is about serving content images appropriately. Um, but more than that, there's a huge technical limitation. If we put anything in CSS, we have to wait before we request a single image we have to wait for all of the HTML to be parsed, all of the CSS to be fetched and applied, and then we can start downloading images. This would not just break prefetching. This would make browsers slower than they were 10 years ago. Now there's proposals out there, um, methods of consolidating media queries with, I'm hesitant to say variables, but a variable-like syntax. Um, to use that with picture, it would, it would require that they be put in line, they be in the head of the document. But that's on the radar. So hopefully it'll be better than having media queries strewn across a bunch of pages, but CSS can't happen. Thank you for throwing yourself on that sword. Hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. I guess, maybe I don't know if I should know this already, but why is there so much bureaucracy with all those browser groups and other spec developer groups because you would think that if we're all, I guess, peers among ourselves, you, we would all collectively want to make things better for everyone. So could you speak to that? It's funny, that's what we said. We were like, hey fellas, we wrote a thing. We don't know how to write a spec, but let's work on this together. It was not well received. Uh, I like that honestly, it's, I know, it's. And I'm not from Boston, I'm from Jersey, so I. You get it. There's a shared violence twixt our two communities. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. The groups, I mean, they become. They become. They become insular over time. They're, you end up with a couple of key players who kind of. I'm being so diplomatic right now. I'm so proud of me. You end up with a few people kind of leading efforts. Um, and web standards sucks. It's across like a mailing lists that look like they're from 1962 and IRC channels, and that's prohibitive to participation. They've kind of been able to enjoy not having developers barge in. And we almost get to be a talking point. I've seen a lot of times on mailing lists, I don't think authors, which is what we are, will, will like this feature. And it's like, you didn't ask. We're right here. So, I mean, a lot of this has been making not dumb, stretchy images. Absolutely, that's 80% of it. But now that we've actually enjoyed some weird measure of success after as arduous as that was, so to speak, um, now people are paying attention. 
Now the W3 is C is saying, okay, we set up a community group. Clearly that wasn't enough. There were a lot of obstacles to making this happen. How do we make this better? Um, and we're in talks about some things. And what with us starting on element queries pretty soon, we are not necessarily going to be the responsive images community group anymore. We are now going to be the responsive bleh, community group. Just we're here and we make a lot of noise on behalf of developers, which would be something, you know? Until I turn ruthless dictator and totally run it into the ground. It's only a matter of time. I can't actually do that, for the record. I don't have that say. Yep. Will there be any shortcuts for MIME types? The SVG one is gross. Um, yeah, a lot of them are a lot shorter. Because SVG is technically made of XML. I didn't make that call. Um, but like the WebP one is image slash WebP. They'll all fall in line with that. Um, yeah, it's just SVG is weird. I like it a lot. Also use SVG where you can, instead of any of this. Maybe this is something I should know too, but um, how do you measure the size of a website? I, I guess you'd use Chrome DevTools? Yeah, there's a network tab that'll show you. We actually put the, I was about to try and live open something and I'm terrified of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to, I can't remember if there's a hyphen in it. So you can use just your general DevTools, click on the network tab, Reload the page, um, shift reload, so you're not on a prime cache, and it'll give you the whole, the whole breakdown. Um, we built a tool called sizersoze.org uh, to solve the mystery of your image weight. I didn't name it. Um, you, can, you can just pass it a URL, and you can put in a couple of like, if I had responsive images breakpoints at X, Y, Z, uh, and it gives you a table showing how much your site weighs now and how much you could save depending on those breakpoints, uh, which is actually really cool if you wanted to get like theoretical about it. But otherwise, network tab will show you what's going on. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And like I said, feel free to stick around for a little while uh, and you know ask questions in person. Um, enjoy the beverages over there. Uh, hope to see some of you back. In two weeks, we're gonna have John Rouser, who I forget where he's at now, but he's been at Amazon and some other places, and he talks about data, and I think he'll be talking about TCP and why it's amazing. Um, but yeah, follow us on Twitter, read our blog. Thank you all for coming, and thank you again, Matt. Yeah.